Well, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. I, I want to begin by thanking all of you for being here this morning. Uh, as we all know, this is a very uh, important topic to talk about, but it's not always the easiest uh, of topics uh, to discuss. And it may be easier in this environment, but I know that many of you in the world that you live in are encountering this with greater and greater frequency. My goal for you this morning, even though I'm an academic pediatric endocrinologist, I'm not going to try to make you a, into a scientist or a physician but I want to be able to empower you to uh, be able to respond to many of the things that are being said within our culture that simply are not true. Now, I have to say that even though I'm gonna be talking about science and best medical practice, I need to make a disclaimer that I'm not representing my university or the hospital where I work at. That's just a requirement that I have. Now, this topic of, of sexual identity and specifically how um, our gender, how we see ourselves in relation to each other. This topic of identity is we have to just at least take a moment to recognize that who we see ourselves as within ourselves and in relation to other people is something that we hold on to very, very deeply. We're very, very guarded in that. And when one, anyone challenges one's understanding of who they believe that they are, there's a natural visceral response that one has. So I want to be able to allow us to acknowledge that because if it doesn't happen this morning, it may, uh, as you move forward from this morning's conversation, if you engage into dialogue with friends and relatives and in your workplace. But we need to move beyond the emotive and we need to be thinking uh, rationally and where the truth lies. And that's why our last talk was so uh, beautiful as far as setting the uh, anthropological and theological basis for my discussion about this question uh, of, as a physician scientist. And again, there's no reason that anyone needs to be defensive in sharing what the church teaches about sexual identity. There's this relationship that, you know, St. John Paul the Great talks about it in his, his beautiful document, Fides et Ratio, about the relationship between faith and reason. We can uh, substitute reason for science. The two wings of a dove that we rise in contemplation of the truth. So they're complementary. But what I'm gonna speak about is, is a side of reason, what science says about this question. And everything that I'm going to share is in no way uh, at all contradictory uh, to uh, what the faith teaches. Uh, I want to draw your attention, I won't spend a lot of time talking about this, uh, uh, this question of what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman, maybe to illustrate this relationship between faith and reason. We put together uh, with John Finley, a philosopher at, at the seminary in St. Louis, um, we, we spent a whole year in dialogue w uh, in a multidisciplinary way with philosophers, theologians, scientists, and, and physicians. Uh, addressing this question. And so each of the chapters in this book addresses it from a different perspective. Uh, my chapter uh, contributed to the biological understanding of what it means to uh, be a man and a woman. And, and to uh, really try to build upon that concept that we learn about in the theology of the body, the sciences tell us something very, very important about who we are as human persons. And when we get that wrong, this is what results in it. So we're talking about individuals that have this experience of who they are as human persons, their, their identity, their gender identity, that is discordant with their sexual identity. And I want to remember that the reason why this is even coming up in the medical profession is that we're addressing real suffering. And the sciences show this very clearly. The people that have this experience uh, have a markedly elevated rate of morbidities, things that um, are not going well. Uh, we already heard a little bit about uh, this increased rate of suicidal ideation and attempt, but they also have a markedly elevated risk of substance abuse, eating disorders, anxiety, uh, depression, uh, in fact, they engage in behaviors that are often harmful to the body, which predisposes them to sexually transmitted diseases. Many of them have been subjected to various forms of uh, abuse. Not all of them, but many of them, either sexual or physical or emotional. So that is very important because what these individuals are, are doing is they're crying out 
for help. The question that we need to ask is what are we offering them and is it truly helpful? So that's what we're going to talk about. You already heard a little bit about, you know, in, in, even in the introduction when everyone raised their hand about, um, you know, encountering individuals or knowing somebody that has this condition. When I started in this conversation over a decade ago, it was very rare for anyone to have somebody they knew that had this experience. But now it is so prevalent. And I want to just share a little bit about the demographics that really gives us some clues about how we address this problem. Because it actually has changed, not only has it grown exponentially, this is data that I'm showing you uh, from the Tavistock Center in the UK, and I show the data just because in that country until very recently, everyone that had this uh, experience of uh, gender dysphoria went to the same institution. Uh, and we can see that in that, and it, it can be shown in other data as well, uh, that there's been a marked increase in the number of people that were coming forward uh, for help in this regard. But uh, this has changed in that initially uh, it was predominantly a condition where biological males uh, were identifying as female. And what we've seen is the greatest rise in this, uh, that's accounting for much of this growth, is a completely different demographic. The largest segment that are now coming forward to gender centers across the United States and in other areas of the world are biological females now identifying as male, and many times uh, with the first experience of this uh, in their adolescent years, as opposed to the prior experience uh, where many of these individuals have this from an earlier point in life. Now that's important to recognize as we think about how we might be able to help these individuals by thinking about what might be going on. So in medicine, we like to have some idea of what we call the etiology or the cause of any condition that we're addressing. And I want to walk you through what we do and do not know about what is going on within this condition. And I'm going to tell you that there are data that suggest that there may be genetic influences. And I want to be very clear when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about influences, not determinants. Okay, uh, one of the examples are looking at uh, identical or non-identical twin studies and looking at one individuals that have the same genetic uh, composition and what is the likelihood if one has this experience, the other one will have the same experience. And there is evidence that there is an elevated rate from the background if you're a non-identical twin, but it doesn't tell us that that is the cause. In fact, all of the research that has looked for the genetic, the, the uh, transgender gene um, has been unsuccessful. They've not been able to do that. And we need to put it in perspective because, um, again, talking about other uh, conditions, this genetic influence is actually higher for other things like alcoholism and compulsive gambling. And that doesn't determine who one is uh, based upon their genetic composition. But we can't discount it, meaning that there may be people that are, f are faced with the same traumas or difficulties that may be more equipped to respond to that than others. We do know this interesting phenomenon that there's an increased incidence of gender dysphoria in autistic children. And we're, we're knowing the increased prevalence. I'm talking about the entire autism spectrum. We don't know fully why that is. There are many hypotheses of why that may be. Um, there's many theories about uh, underlying psychopathology. And there's a, a, the, you know, an association between mental illness and gender dysphoria. Many of the claims by the ideologists are that their mental difficulties are resulting from society not accepting them as having this sex discordant gender identity. Ignoring the fact that many of these individuals had antecedent, meaning before they uh, had gender dysphoria, they had these other uh, issues going on. And when we talk about suicide rates, it's important to recognize that it more directly correlates with the mental illness than the transgender identity. And I'll show you some data that actually uh, uh, brings that home. Then there's the question of environmental contributors uh, to this condition, okay? And we talked a little bit about social contagion as a hypothesis, which is actually a very strong hypothesis that by ideological grounds alone is uh, there's attempts to dismiss this. You know, why would an entire group of adolescent uh, females all come out at the same time uh, claiming to be transgender? There are some data that, that there are, are differences in individuals in the family dynamic and relationships, the relationship between the father and the children or the mother and the children, um, and many examples of individuals where the, the parents are going through divorce. 
Um, there are, are stories that if you delve into this about uh, adverse child events, either, again, physical or sexual abuse in, in other ways, not just within the family, but uh, within uh, uh, their uh, society. Um, and, you know, in the end, we take all of this information, we still don't have the answer to the question. There's so much we don't know about what is going on in these individuals. The best that we can say is that it's very likely to be multifactorial, meaning that in any one individual, there can be different contributors in both nature and degree that are contributing to this condition. So I caution you not to assume if you encounter somebody that they were, grew up in a, in, a, in a harmful relationship with their family or that they were subject to abuse. That may apply to many individuals, but not all of them. But it's important to recognize, especially as we, we talk about the scientific evidence, this uh, very fact about being multifactorial and, uh, is going to be very important as we look at, at the quality of the evidence uh, that we see. I'm going to add to what we heard in the last talk about our sexual identity and address some of the uh, untruths uh, that are being put forward on an ideological basis. Um, not only that, that our minds determine who we are, okay, and we'll talk a little bit about what that is, but also this question about sex being along a continuum. You may have heard that, right, that sex is no longer, we, science has said that it's no longer male and female, that you can be anywhere along that spectrum. And now, in my world as an endocrinologist, I do encounter individuals that are born with ambiguous genitalia. Okay, where the answer at the time of birth that all parents usually ask, if they don't find out prenatally, is it a boy or a girl, the answer is I don't know. Okay, they, they do have a sexual identity, we may have difficulty assigning that. But in all of this, we need to keep in mind that this, you know, we talk in the church about unitive and procreative dimensions. From a biological standpoint, sex has everything to do with reproduction of how uh, individuals, uh, male and female, come together, engage in sexual union, and the result of that is to produce a new human being. But not only in, in the generation of that human, new human life, when we talk about gender roles, it has a lot to do from a biological basis, the giftedness that one has as male or female, in fulfilling that responsibility of also raising that child to maturity. And it's a, it's, a, it's a very important concept where there's a division of labor, biologically, not just uh, socially and psychologically. And, and so we need to keep in mind that as we talk about sex, it is inherently binary, okay? And, and I say this all the time in, in my students when we talk about uh, across the animal kingdom. When I do experiments with rodents, I don't ask them to take a survey to determine what they feel like to be able to know which group to put them in when I do the scientific study. To my knowledge, there are still two and only two gonads, testes, testes and ovaries, that participate in that reproductive purpose. Most of the individuals I care for that have disorders of sexual development have impaired or absent fertility. So that, and, but that is also, it's important to know that when we talk about um, sex, they try to, uh, people often try to make it more complicated than it really is. It is important that there are many dimensions to what makes one male or female, it's not solely based on the genetic comp or the, the chromosomal constitution because it's actually the genetic information present in the chromosomes that lead to differences in sexual differentiation. There's a specific region in the Y chromosome called SRY, sex determining region of the Y chromosome, that actually drives a developmental program that leads to the creation of testes and the male phenotype. There are equally factors that, that drive the female reproductive tract, and don't rem this isn't intended for you to, to, to take notes and know all the details. But it is very beautiful, okay, that as at the time of conception, um, this sexual identity is, is largely determined, and then it, in the process of development, one differentiates uh, from a bipotential state into either me male or female. But it's not only in the reproductive organs. This is really important to recognize that the sexual differences that are present are found in every single uh, nucleated cell in the body. Okay? And, and many of the differences are not just genetic, 
uh, there are epigenetic changes, meaning that there's modifications of our DNA that lead to differences in how genes are turned on and off. Uh, and it's a very, very important concept. In fact, there are over 6,000 sex differentially uh, expressed genes between males and females. And this is independent of sex steroid hormone exposure. So when you look in a cultured uh, experiment to look at what genes are, are turned on and off, you can see this really throughout the body. And the programming is actually, very, if, you if you take time to think about it, has everything to do with division of labor as, as the male of a, of a member, not just in humans, but in in, in the animal kingdom of predominantly having a role as a provident provider, uh, protecting uh, the mother and the child, providing food for, for that child, uh, and the female in, in a nurturative role of being able to raise um, that, uh, that child. And why is that important? Well, there's always a trade-off, right? So that um, if both males and females had to have both roles, it would be much more difficult to fulfill that successfully. So that increased lean body mass is a, is a male trait, which has a cost. It actually affects uh, uh, your susceptibility to uh, illness and lifespan. Uh, being uh, female and having to gestate uh, a, a foreign DNA within your body leads to predisposition to autoimmune diseases. So these are real things that we know in other areas of medicine and science that are very important. As, as uh, uh, John talked about in the last talk, uh, there are sexual differences present uh, in the brain, the largest sexual organ of the body, and we've known this for many years, and much of this actually relates to these differences uh, between males and females. Okay, in the roles that they traditionally take, um, not just in, in a, a societal way, in a, in a maybe a, a artificial way, but in real uh, substantive ways. But you can't take that information about the sexual differences between males and females to be able to make a conclusion that one can be born in the wrong body. And many people have tried to do this. They've looked at many different uh, observations about uh, the way the brains are structured and the way the brain acts in, in males and females to make that claim. And I won't go into the details of that, but what they fail to recognize are, are two very important features. One, that the brain has this phenomenon known as plasticity, meaning that the environment itself can change the way the brain behaves. So it's this question of chicken or egg, right? Is it the differences in the way one is exposed to different uh, things that leads to the, the observation that there are differences? And it also fails to account for the tremendous overlap that we see between uh, these uh, uh, features. So that's to say that, that there's more of a particular trait in a male versus a female doesn't mean that, that one who's male can't do some of the roles that females typically will do. Okay, there's much overlap. And I'll give you an example that may be very helpful for you. We know from a biological standpoint that on average, males are five inches taller than females. Okay, that, that's a known fact, right? But I challenge anyone here in the room to determine the sex of an individual by measuring their height. You can't do it. And why is that? Well, there's tremendous overlap in those, uh, those findings. And the same overlap that we're talking about, and I'm showing you on, on the uh, left-hand side of the slide there, are in the same brain regions, for example, that, that people have put forward uh, related to sexual identity. So there's tremendous overlap in those traits. So we're not going to get an answer there. Now, we're left with just understanding uh, of who we are as male and female uh, and the differences that are present within the body as male and female. And that's going to be very, very important as we consider any type of medical intervention to help to alleviate the suffering that these individuals are experiencing. Now again, my goal is not to make you a scientist if you're not already, um, or a physician, but I need to at least walk you through the way that, that science is normally conducted, because it's going to be important as you look at the scientific evidence that is being put forward to advocate for an affirmation-only approach to gender dysphoria where there are many questions and outright problems that one uh, can, uh, can see. Now, if we begin, in all of science, we begin often with premises. These are things that are not experimentally verifiable, but it's our starting point of something that we believe, okay? And based upon a, a premise, we can de develop what we call a hypothesis. And from the hypothesis, then we can design an experiment to be able to trust, test the validity of that hypothesis. In fact, in the area of science, we begin with a state of skepticism. We actually start believing that there is no difference between an intervention and a response, and we look for evidence 
to disprove what we call the null hypothesis. Okay? Now, that's very different than what's going on right now uh, in many areas of science, and particularly in this area of gender dysphoria. It's, it's actually bad science to begin with a conclusion and then look for evidence to support what you already believe. And that is the way that it is often being done. But even before we do that, let's look at the fundamental premises that in, in relation to gender dysphoria and the approach to helping alleviate the suffering. If you believe, as a premise, that gender dysphoria is predominantly the result of psychological factors, you're going to then generate hypotheses that restoration to health is going to be achieved by addressing those underlying psychological difficulties. That makes a lot of sense. Okay? Now, in contrast, if you believe the scientific premise that when there's sex gender identity discordance, that the mind is completely healthy and that the body itself is misformed in some way, then you're going to hypothesize that the way to restore health is to change the appearance of the body to conform to one's identity. So if you believe the premise, the approach actually makes sense. Okay? But we need to ask the question, is the premise valid? Not only that, when you do science, you're either going to prove or disprove your hypothesis. And again, if you're starting with a premise that's false, your hypothesis is, is going to fall apart. Now, you also may have uh, gotten the impression that there's only one solution to this problem. And that's what's put forward uh, very um, uh, frequently. Um, the, the, the approach that you'll hear about most often, and I'll spend most of my time talking about, uh, is the affirmative approach, where you accept one's gender identity and you change the body, and we'll go into that in more detail. But it's important to know that historically, uh, this was recognized in that first premise, okay, and the approach was to actually help that individual uh, be able to uh, realign their gender identity with their sex. And it, uh, I use the term reparative. You may have heard a different term that's intentionally designed to be purgative, meaning to, to evoke um, a visceral response called conversion therapy, related to interventions that were used decades ago in same-sex attraction that nearly everyone would acknowledge were unethical and ineffective. But it's intentional to be able to say uh, conversion therapy because, and it's often assumed and it's often said that conversion therapy is harmful and it doesn't work. What they fail to mention is, is that it's unwanted and it's not actually tried. But in that approach, one tries to underline at least you know, the psychological influences that might have been present that leading to this sex discord and gender identity. And it, it certainly believes that that first premise that the problem uh, is in the mind. So it, psychological interventions to alleviate distress are the focus of this approach. Uh, and then one will actually seek to ask questions about what has gone on in their life that might have contributed to that experience and then to be able to spend time trying to address those underlying issues. And I think one can uh, use this approach without even having a goal of changing one's gender identity merely to address the underlying difficulties. For example, if there are antecedent psychological factors, depression, anxiety, maybe we should begin by addressing the depression and anxiety. Okay, um, and it's important to note uh, that when people dismiss this, it's without any consideration of some of the modern psychological uh, uh, methods uh, that are now available that are very effective. So again, anxiety using cognitive behavioral therapy and the, and the like. Now there's a second approach known as, uh, I, I call it the expectant approach, watch and wait, uh, where one doesn't have a goal of, of any outcome, but it merely acknowledges the fact, as, as you heard earlier, that in children that experience sex discord and gender identity um, in, before they enter into puberty, by merely leaving them alone, doing nothing at all, that the vast majority of them will have spontaneous realignment of their gender identity uh, with their biological sex. And, and for those of you in the audience that want scientific evidence, I'm happy to provide you with each of the uh, publications, the papers themselves, that speak to this. And these are a few of them. Now, they do have limitations, OK? But consistently, this experience uh, of realignment uh, has been shown throughout uh, the, the literature that has been published prior to the ideological takeover of, of the scientific enterprise. 
This was preferred even in the, the professional uh, recommendations until very recently to be uh, done in prepubertal children that had this experience, okay? Because um, the concern was, was that if this was gonna resolve spontaneously, we don't want to be able to interfere with that. Um, now, even though it doesn't uh, understand for sure uh, what the outcome is going to be or even predict what it's going to be, it does see this as a desirable outcome. And the reason for that is that as we go into the medical interventions, if somebody has this experience of, of a desistance, we call it, realignment of gender identity with sex, uh, that one is not going to be exposed to the risks associated with that, so it's a desirable outcome. Um, now, the, the last approach is the one that we'll need to spend the most uh, time with because that's the pre prevalent model here in the United States. Um, and this is the affirmation approach. And the goal in that intervention is to change the appearance of the body to conform to gender identity. It's based upon the premise that gender variation is normal. And we can ask many questions about whether that's a valid premise. Uh, and, and the question always is, if this is normal, then why do we need the medical profession to intervene um, in this uh, particular uh, in instance? Um, the, the, the steps uh, medically begin with looking at normally timed puberty, that transition from uh, childhood to adulthood uh, in relation to reproductive capacity itself is a disease that needs to be stopped and halted. Uh, and then to offer, traditionally it was 16 years of age, these age limits have been lowered, uh, lower and lower until the latest uh, iteration of, of the WPATH, the World Professional Trans, uh, Association for Transgender Health, took away all age limits whatsoever in the engagement of, of these interventions. By cross-sex hormones, I mean the administration of testosterone to a biological female or estrogen to a biological uh, male. And then uh, and later, uh, it had been at the age of majority, 18 years of age usually, now offered at younger and younger ages to uh, surgically alter the body to conform to one's gender identity. Most often, what we call top surgery, uh, bilateral mastectomies in females that desire to appear, appear as, as male, uh, and breast augmentation surgery in males uh, desiring to appear as female, a uh, smaller percentage will, will have the genital um, surgery that, uh, to, to conform that. Now, as we look at this affirmative approach, the be I'm gonna begin by just stating that it's incredibly difficult as a physician scientist to engage in the normal dialogue that we do in science about the merits of this intervention, this, this affirmative approach, because many of the professional societies um, have put forward statements uh, saying that the affirmative approach is the only approach that one should use. Now, it's also important to note that it's not the entire membership of the societies, like the endocrine society that I belong to. It's usually small interest groups um, that uh, really uh, weed out people that have uh, altering opinions but it's been very difficult. But I wanna at least uh, introduce you to some of the scientific evidence that is used to support this model and the problems that are present uh, within that. And to do that, I need to share with you that, that when we talk about evidence, not all evidence is created equal. Okay, that there are layers uh, to evidence from the lowest uh, evidence, which is expert opinion or a case report, all the way up to a, what we call a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials, the, the, the pinnacle of the studies. And there are fewer of, of the top level uh, studies, but they're very important in the reliability of any conclusions that are being made and the likelihood that the intervention itself is going to have the desired effect. Now, fortunately for my endocrine society um, that put forward guidelines uh, advocating for this affirmation approach, they first did this in 2009 and then revised them in 2017, they used a formal system for assessing the quality of the evidence. It's called the GRADE system, G-R-A-D-E, and I just want to draw your attention uh, to the fact that nearly all of the recommendations that were made in those guidelines were based upon low or very low quality evidence. What does that mean? By definition, very low quality evidence means that we have very little confidence in the effect estimate, meaning that the true effect is likely to be substantially different from the estimate of the effect, meaning that uh, we're not very sure if we're doing the right thing and we're likely not doing the right thing, okay? Nearly all of the recommendations that were made were in that category, either low or very low. The only ones that got to the moderate level were for side effects, so adverse medical effects related to that. 
And why is that? I want to at least uh, introduce you to some of that data so that you can understand why it's low quality data. Because in all of research, uh, we have to recognize that, that the investigator can have bias. Right? And, um, and that the bias can be very significant. Most of the studies that are used to support the affirmative model uh, have, are very small in size. Again, for a multifactorial condition, that may lead to erroneous conclusions. Many of them are poorly controlled or even uncontrolled. They have no control group whatsoever. They're very short dur uh, duration and for something that can take many years to evolve. Um, they're often using methodologies that are re retrospective or observational that the best they can do is establish associations, not a causal relationship between the intervention and the response. And when they're not controlled for other variables, many times in these studies, there are other components that may, if they do see benefit, are, are potentially the re a responsible factor, like psychotherapy. Okay, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So let's talk about biases. Uh, many of the studies are, are involve what's called selection bias. Uh, the most, uh, uh, I think, the widely cited is the 2015 U.S. Transgender Survey. This is where they went on the internet and recruited through advocacy groups those that were going to complete a survey where it was stated up front that the goal was to, to prove the injustice that was going on in those not being able to get affirmative care. And it doesn't take a scientist to recognize there may be problems in that uh, approach, right? So that you're going to recruit only people that, that have one particular viewpoint. Uh, if they actually had an adverse outcome and they're no longer involved in that advocacy group, um, either they've run as far away as they can from that group or you know, that they committed suicide, for example, they're not going to be included in that population. Okay, and then there's also a, a, a phenomenon known as demand bias. If you tell somebody what the intent of the study is, people will change their answers to conform uh, to the result that they think they're supposed to have. And then we have to acknowledge this observation bias. And I think that we, again, recognizing we all have bias, it's the most dangerous when we deny that the biases occur. We need to acknowledge that biases are there and we work as best we can to minimize those biases in the way that we conduct the research studies. Now, I don't expect you to know uh, or see all of the data on this slide. I'm just showing you about a dozen or so of the, the most commonly cited scientific studies supporting the affirmative model. And what I'm showing you are many of the different aspects of these limitations and, and biases and difficulties. All of the uh, ones in the uh, color red are the problems with these, these highly cited papers. Okay, and I, I draw your attention to sample size, time of follow-up, uh, their actual design, and then in that last uh, uh, column about confounders, again, very, very prevalent in the literature, not accounting for that, the fact that many of these individuals where they've seen benefit um, are also receiving psychotherapy, and they've never controlled for that to know whether that's a, a, a good approach. Now, with that background, I'm going to say a little bit about uh, the different components of the medical intervention. I'm going to talk about um, Maybe this isn't a medical intervention, but it does involve all of us uh, in the room here, in, in myself as well, in the hospital, about this, this concept of social affirmation. And this is, again, where we're going to encounter this most frequently, about using a preferred name, pronoun, uh, dressing in a particular way, and have a access to intimate facilities like locker rooms and, and, and bathrooms. And this is advocated uh, at a very early age. Uh, we heard in our, in our first talk a little bit about some of the problems that might come from that. Keep in mind that this affirmative uh, approach of social affirmation has never been subjected to scientific scrutiny. There's never been a randomized controlled trial to say whether this is beneficial or whether alternative approaches might uh, be just as beneficial or even more. Um, and there is a concern that's borne out by data that's emerging that this is not a neutral intervention. Okay, it's not just a compassionate way of intervening that allows an individual you know, to explore their gender identity. There's existing data that suggests that it may actually alter the outcome as you heard in the first talk. This is just, again, some of those uh, studies that I mentioned earlier about the normal spontaneous realignment of gender identity with sex. And in red, I'm showing you the number of people uh, that persist. So it's the opposite of desistance. So those are the people that go on uh, to continue to have a, a sex discordant gender identity. And again, uh, it's a very uh, small amount, uh, less than uh, 20%. Now, if you look at the few papers that have actually tried to look at what is the persistence of sex discord and gender identity 
After you socially affirm an individual, it's just the opposite. 94% of the individuals uh, will persist in that transgender identity um, if you engage in social affirmation. So there's met much that we could say about this, about the age of what, which one's intervening, when they're presenting the new demographics. Uh, it's very difficult uh, in our current modern culture to be able to replicate some of the earlier studies because it's so prevalent in what's going on, but we need to be able to recognize that. Now, let's go on and say a little bit about this next stage of, of viewing a normally timed puberty as a disease. And I want you to at least be familiar with the arguments that are made um, as to why this might be a good idea, and we can challenge each of them. The first is that it's claimed to be entirely safe and fully reversible, okay? Um, now, entirely safe uh, is not true because they, they actually will use data for the use of these medications in treating an entirely different condition known as precocious puberty in which you have abnormally early puberty and they translate that into a different condition and say we don't need to do the studies in the adolescents because we already know that it's safe in, in children. It's not FDA approved for this indication. It's never been rigorously studied as far as the effects and there are many other problems uh, that may occur. Uh, one of the major uh, uh, risks is change in bone density because the adolescence is a time where the sex steroid hormones are important for accruing a maximal bone density that is gonna be important throughout the rest of life. Fully reversible, uh, let me say a little bit about that. What they mean by that is that if you give them the hormones to suppress puberty, if you take them away, puberty will resume. Okay, and that part is true. However, what they fail to uh, recognize is that you're interrupting a develop developmental process. The, the physical changes of puberty happen uh, along uh, the same time as the psychological development known as adolescence. And if you dissociate the two, even if you allow the child later in life to, to be able to um, have those signals of puberty, you've disrupted that. You can never buy back time. And there are very significant questions about whether that's a safe thing to be able to do. Now, the, the uh, goal of alleviating dysphoria may be true in the short run, but it may not be a good thing in the long run. And let me explain uh, in a way that I think all of you can identify with. Um, we know that adolescence is an inherently stressful time for everyone, okay? And it's a time where one experiences uh, a, a search for their own identity, right? Uh, take the equivalent of, of um, your child that is struggling with anxiety over having a math test next week, right? And you say, well, you don't have to take the test. And the anxiety level goes down. But have you helped that child? There's a necessity of them going through this difficult time to be able to integrate and be able to function later in life. So we can ask about whether that's a good thing to have. Um, we already talked about uh, this claim that it just buys them more time. It's not a neutral intervention, just like uh, social affirmation. In fact, the data is even stronger when one engages in pubertal blockade nearly all 98 plus percent of individuals that receive pubertal block, puberty blockers will go on uh, to desire cross-sex hormones, okay? So that this is not just buying them time, it's actually getting them further and further down uh, into that, uh, that trajectory. Um, now, the, 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 um, uh, the, the goal of, of uh, a cosmetic outcome, uh, uh, it's easier to not have to reverse the bodily changes that one does not want to have. Uh, but again, this developmental change when the body, when a female is developing breasts, or the male is developing you know, virilization, uh, can often be a process um, that allows that individual to overcome some difficulties that they're having and they're really preventing that from occurring. Again, um, uh, I've uh, outlined many of these in a, in a prior publication for many years ago um, that uh, was published. It's available. I can send it to anyone who would like it. It's freely available on the internet. Um, the other thing that I haven't mentioned yet is are the effects on the brain. Uh, that we know that the brain is not fully mature until the early 20s. Developmental uh, processes are going on uh, throughout childhood. We know that sex steroid hormones are very important in that brain development. Uh, we know that there are both what we call activational and organizational effects of sex steroid hormones, meaning that it changes the way the brain is structured and it changes the way the neurons in the brain are firing. This is known, it not, had not been controversial uh, in research uh, looking at this development uh, until it was applied to gender dysphoria, and we know very little, if anything, about how disruption of this uh, process might be affecting the uh, 
uh, development and maturation of that uh, brain in that individual that is struggling with this condition. We know this, again, the examples of the brain uh, development uh, in other areas as a pediatrician, uh, but as a, as a parent or as anyone uh, that, that works with children, that they're inherently impulsive. Um, they're thinking about immediate gratification. They're not thinking about long-term effects. It's a very reason why we put limits on when they can buy alcohol or even purchase cigarettes. But the claim is made that in the area of gender identity, that doesn't matter, and one can definitively have the capacity to be able to make life-altering decisions without fully knowing uh, what it is that they are giving up. Um, I want to draw your attention um, to another uh, aspect that um, most of you are not going to um, go on the internet and actually pull up the actual papers, although again, I encourage you to do so. But what you hear in the media is often a very, um, uh, de, uh, very much a distortion of what the science is actually saying. I'm going to give you one example. Um, this is a study that was published in the flagship journal of the, of the American Academy of Pediatrics in 2000. It was based upon that uh, 2015 transgender uh, survey data that I told you um, had many limitations and weaknesses. Uh, the authors of this paper uh, looked at whether one was offered puberty blockers or desired puberty blockers and received them or desired them and did not receive them. And what they concluded um, is that if you look at that data in that uh, a flawed survey, that there was an association with lifetime suicidality, meaning that had they thought about committing suicide. What they, uh, and what the media went, went crazy with this, and, and many of the headlines in the news was that it's been shown now that puberty blockers prevent suicide, which the paper itself never said, right? And they also failed to say that there could be other explanations for the data. If you look into the data in the paper, in fact, current suicidality was actually no different, in fact, numerically higher in those that had received the puberty blockers, okay? And that they didn't even consider the fact that maybe why they weren't offered puberty blockers was because they had other issues going on. But this is what the media says, and this is what many people believe. And I will tell you that there are numerous other examples in which what one hears is not what the science is actually actually saying, it's a distortion, uh, and it's moved even beyond that. You may know this, that the, now the, the push is, is to prevent uh, things from getting published that, that don't go along with the narrative. We saw this in the uh, Mifeprestone uh, data where they just uh, retracted uh, several papers that they didn't like the uh, conclusion, and then they said that they were biased um, in the results. That happened with uh, the social contagion hypothesis by my colleague Lisa Littman. Now, I want to go through very quickly here in the last couple minutes uh, just some of the, the uh, concerns that related to what I already presented at the beginning about the biological differences between males and females. It shouldn't come as a surprise that giving uh, hormones, sex steroid hormones, to somebody that shouldn't be receiving those levels um, at, that, at that level. First, it's important to recognize males and females have both testosterone and estrogen, okay? There's not an absolute difference between the two. It's uh, by the amount that one receives uh, and the time of life that one's at. Uh, males have predominantly testosterone, uh, male, females have estrogen. How these hormones work is that they, they lead to signaling differences throughout the body. So they actually uh, work at the level of the cell nucleus and turn on and off various genes throughout the body. So you're not just influencing the, the desired phenotypic change in the sec secondary sexual characteristics, you're altering the body uh, consistently throughout the body. Let's take one example, the difference uh, between males and females uh, in, re in uh, testosterone levels. Um, it, when we're talking, just to put this in perspective, the, in blue is the normal levels of testosterone in a female. Right below that, I show the levels that we see in a medical condition known as polycystic ovarian syndrome that we know is associated with insulin resistance, increased cardiovascular risk. We recognize this as a disease, and we try to be able to alleviate that hyperandrogenism. If you look in red, below that, the levels of testosterone that can be seen in androgen-secreting tumors. And then, on the lowest level, we see what, it, what are these females being exposed to as far as testosterone levels to, in this affirmation approach. And it's not surprising then that when we look at the data, uh, we start to see many, many uh, adverse effects. In, um, now, the biggest is going to be related to fertility, okay, and that we can expect that there's going to be reduced fertility. Uh, in fact, if you take an immature gonad that you have not allowed to develop by giving them puberty blockers and then expose them to the cross-sex hormones, the expected effect is permanent sterility. And to my knowledge, there's not been a single case of, of uh, fertility uh, following that intervention.
Um, there's uh, effects that in increase risk of stroke, cardiovascular disease, even severe acne, and, and by this I'm talking disfigure, uh, disfiguring acne to somebody who's already self-conscious about their bodily appearance. And then the question about cancer risk. Again, I have dozens upon dozens of studies um, that actually show that there's a risk associated with this. Many of those that are offering the affirmative approach acknowledge and accept this and recognize it. They tend to minimize it, and they always use the argument, well, we can accept that risk because we're preventing them from committing suicide. However, the data does not support that claim. You heard earlier you know, the, the Swedish study in adults where they looked 20 years after receiving this affirmative approach that when they looked at this population-based study where everyone in that country they have data on so it avoids some of the biases, that the, the completed suicide rate was 19-fold above the background population. Now, I will, I will say that you can't conclude from that type of study what the intervention did. It didn't necessarily raise it because we don't have a control group to say what would have happened if they didn't, but we can certainly say with confidence it didn't fix the problem. Problem, okay, that these are our issues. And there's more recent data that show that, that the psychological uh, needs are persistent in this population, that if we control for psychiatric comorbidities, that there's no difference. Okay, the affirmative approach doesn't affect that at all. Those that are, are still receiving medications for depression and anxiety and are in psychotherapy, if anything, go up. Uh, in those that are receiving this intervention. So we have to be uh, aware of that. Now, that's not just me uh, uh, making a, a personal opinion on this. This is actually happening internationally. Uh, the countries that first began uh, in this intervention um, uh, have uh, begun uh, to see the effects of what's going on and recognizing that there are, are increasing numbers of individuals that are coming forward that uh, are understanding that they've been harmed by this. So in Sweden, Finland, the UK, uh, in other areas, uh, they're actually uh, looking at the evidence uh, there's been several systematic reviews that have been done. Um, this is one that was done in Sweden where they looked at, um, the, it's a very topical area, so they found over 10,000 papers that were published on this topic, but when they used rigorous scientific uh, criteria for uh, the quality of research that was being done, they only uncovered 24 studies that they could even analyze. The rest of them didn't have the, the, the quality to be able to make an analysis, and they concluded that based upon these studies, uh, that they, they weren't able to know uh, anything about the outcomes with certainty. Um, they did uh, validate some of the concerns about bone density, but that was about the best that they could do. And these countries are now stepping back and prioritizing psychological intervention in a way that the United States is still saying it should be illegal, conversion therapy, exploring uh, whether one has psychological traumas, addressing the underlying um, uh, traumas that one may have. So I want to just, uh, just end here uh, by just summarizing what I've shared with you. Again, I, I'm very happy to provide you with any of the scientific evidence. I want you to walk away from here just remembering that these are people that are suffering. And we need to have compassion um, and understanding for that suffering. We don't fully understand all of why they're experiencing this. We have some clues. Uh, it may uh, help influence how we approach this. The affirmative approach is based uh, very heavily, if not predominantly, on ideological assumptions, and the scientific evidence itself is extremely weak, and that many of these patients continue to suffer after uh, being socially uh, or medically affirmed, and there certainly is a need for much greater research to be done that includes investigation about uh, the effectiveness of psychological approaches. Uh, we're hopeful uh, in at least in other areas of the world that that's going to be conducted uh, in the near future. I'm not as hopeful that it's going to happen as, as readily here in the United States until we accept uh, these limitations. Um, again, uh, we can certainly, I'm going to leave it to Father to, to talk about the pastoral response, uh, but just recognizing that um, in the area of, of science and medicine, uh, and what's compassionate is reliance on truth, uh, we need to be able to um, uh, reinforce what we know about the physical, so, uh, social, and emotional, and spiritual nature of uh, sexuality. Uh, we can't jettison that if we hope to be successful. And then uh, lastly, I'll just say that if you want to uh, do some other reading on this, there are some good websites, the biological integrity website, uh, uh, the Person and Identity Project uh, by uh, uh, Mary Hassan and, and her colleagues. Um, and if you want to go into the science, the Society for Evidence-Based uh, Gender Medicine, or SEGM, um, can provide you with some of the literature there. Um, there's some of the listed papers uh, that I have uh, from things that, that I've written in this area as well. I want to thank you for your attention, um, and I look forward uh, to continuing this dialogue uh, today. Thank you.